Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Donnelly. I am a senior analyst at a digital marketing research and consulting firm called eConsultancy. Um, and I've actually just, I've only just started working there relatively recently because up until um, last May, I actually worked here in DCU. Um, I worked here for five years full time. And before that, uh, among some other experience, I also did my undergraduate degree and my master's degree here. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, customer experience and the customer experience imperative. And the reason why I want to talk to you about that is because, particularly for the marketing students in the room, uh, we think that the, the marketing funnel, as we know it, um, doesn't work anymore. Um, in fact, it's actually just, it's something that we constructed as marketers uh, to help visualize the flow that, that a, a consumer goes through to make a decision. Um, but consumers don't actually know what the marketing funnel is. Only we know what the marketing funnel is. And while this model did serve a purpose um, up until relatively recently, um, perhaps it was a bit one-sided because it's very much focused on driving intention to purchase. Uh, but it's, it was kind of haphazard in that we were kind of hoping once somebody purchases our product, if they like it, then maybe they will become uh, loyal customers of our brand. Uh, but it doesn't really work anymore because uh, the marketing funnel um, probably looks a bit more like a spider web nowadays than an actual funnel. And if we think of all of the different channels where we try and engage uh, with our customers, so Dara did a, a poll earlier on about all of the different social media platforms that people are on. Um, so if we think of those platforms and then if we think of devices, it becomes incredibly difficult to map that funnel. So the Internet Advertising Bureau, they produced some research earlier this year where they said that the average household has about seven internet-enabled devices. And I think that makes sense if we think of our smartphones, laptops, uh, tablet devices, and so on. And apparently, in our personal time as opposed to our work time, we spend more time on mobile than we do on our desktop. And another kind of scary stat is apparently that the average person checks their phone about 50 times a day. Um, I would not like to know what that answer is for me, but it's probably quite a, a disturbing number. Um, and in the UK, mobile traffic now accounts for about 45% of all e-commerce traffic in the UK. So that's not actually conversions and purchases, but still, in terms of traffic, we're almost at 50%. Um, so that makes our job as marketers in tracking this consumer decision journey very, very difficult. Um, so a couple of years ago, eConsultancy uh, wrote uh, a short manifesto called the Modern Marketing Manifesto, uh, and where we said, customers don't recognize lines and neither should we. Online, offline, above the line, below the line, it doesn't matter. Uh, we need to think and deliver experiences um, and marketing without deline delineation because our customers aren't thinking about marketing, they're thinking about experiences. And if we think about what does a customer experience look like, what does that actually mean? Well, let's think back to the, the medieval marketplace where we have a guy selling his, his produce um, and he very much lives and dies by his own reputation. Uh, because if he sells something that, that isn't very good, uh, people aren't going to back, go back to him. And word of mouth was very important at the time. Um, and if we think about nowadays, perhaps what social media has done, it has given brands and companies the opportunity to kind of interact with people one-to-one uh, -one again. Because about 100 years ago, uh, with the advent of radio, there was a, a disconnection between, uh, there was less immediacy between customers and brands. All of a sudden, there was, this, there was quite a distance. But now, actually, there's an opportunity to engage one-on-one -on -one again in kind of a more human way. Uh, and there, there are a number of brands who are kind of taking advantage of this. So ASOS, the e-commerce store, who you may be very familiar with, they've done a very interesting thing on Twitter whereby they actually have uh, fashion advisors um, who can give you advice and so on. So while, this, while ASOS is a kind of a pure play business, it's purely online, they've introduced this very human 
elements whereby people can interact with them uh, through Twitter and, th and interact with individuals. So it's not surprising then that in some of our recent research at eConsultancy, we said to marketing directors and e-commerce professionals, um, what is the most e exciting opportunity for you uh, to address over the next five years? Um, and we can see that the majority of brands and companies, they said, actually, it's customer experience. So while we talk about big data and content marketing is very popular at the moment, um, and mobile and so on, actually, not that these things are all discrete, but customer experience very clearly comes out on top there. Um, so we mentioned the, the ASOS example. Um, but we can't necessarily think about customer experience as being completely distinct from social media. So when we asked organizations, well, what kind of skill areas are, are most important for marketers these days? Um, funnily enough, while web analytics are very important and there's a lot of talk about data science and the difference between a data scientist and a data analyst and so on, social media activity is actually a very important thing to address. Um, but what does that look like? Well, Unlike what you, what you may think, it's not actually the mechanical knowledge of using some of the different social media platforms. Do you know why? Because there's just so many of them now. Um, and even if you do become a master at using Facebook advertising and Facebook insights, they change their interface so often and they introduce new products so often, that knowledge goes out of date. So in actual fact, uh, what they say is what's really important actually is the ability to deliver really good customer service. And even more important than that is creativity. So it's about kind of treating people very much like human beings. With that in mind, I have a short video to show you. Hello, uh, just after semi-skimmed milk. Your search for semi-skimmed milk returned zero results. You don't sell milk. Your search for milk returned 52,256 results. Your top hit, milk of magnesia. No. Milk floats of yesteryear. No. This milk-themed family wall planner. No, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for, you know, normal milk. Couldn't find what you were looking for. That's what I'm saying. I couldn't find it, so I'm asking you if you could... Advanced search. All right, let's do this. Keyword, now, go. Uh, yeah, OK. Milk. Please narrow your search by using one of the following filters. Kayaks, packet 12, self-cleaning, breakfast and condiment. That one, breakfast. One result. Milk, skim semi. Semi skim milk. That's what I first asked you for. Uh... It's milk skimmed semi. So that's actually an ad for Google Analytics, but I think the point is that we need to treat uh, people, particularly online, as human beings because people really value that human experience. And that's really important now, particularly with mobile devices. For anybody that keeps their mobile phone in their breast pocket, it really is close to our heart. There's that sort of immediate connection and we expect people to, uh, to communicate us, with us in a personal way. So um, we mentioned customer experience and that is going to be a way for, for brands to, uh, to focus on over the next five years. But when we ask companies, how are, they, how are they going to differentiate themselves from competitors over the next five years, very interestingly, they said, through customer service and through customer experience, not through price. Um, and that's really important because by uh, competing on price, all we're doing is racing to the bottom. And I think if you observe some of the, particularly some of the retail store ads, supermarkets and so on, over the next six weeks on the lead up to, to Christmas, I think you'll notice um, that the likes of Tesco's, um, Dunn stores and so on, they won't necessarily be advertising based on price. They may advertise based on, if you come into our store, we'll have everything that you need and uh, you'll be able to get all of the things you need to, to have a perfect Christmas day. And the reason why they need to do that is because Lidl and Aldi 
They've upped their game. They're, they're eating everybody's lunch. And in their advertising, their advertising isn't necessarily all about price anymore, which it was a few years ago because they are cheaper. Their advertising is about, well, actually, the quality of our produce is just as good, if not better, than what you can get in Tesco and so on. Um, and this kind of increased focus on customer experience, um, it's being driven by consumer behavior. It's not just something that companies have decided to do. So uh, when we surveyed uh, consumers and we said kind of what, what do you want or what do you expect, they said that consumers uh, increasingly expect us to provide relevant information and products in any marketing channel. Um, so we need to think kind of uh, uh, multi-channel and consumers increasingly expect us to provide uh, relevant information regardless of the, of the device that somebody is on. So that kind of changes things for us as marketers and also as digital marketers. So up until um, last year, um, in 2014, there would have been a lot of talk of, oh, we need to have a mobile optimized website and so on. And people were thinking, and we're, two or three years ago, there would have been kind of discussions about, we need to have an app. Why? Just because we just need to have an app. All of our competitors have an app. But we need to think of in a more holistic way now and think multi-channel and think about, okay, what do our customers expect? So instead of thinking th about this whole thing, mobile first and so on, we actually need to think customer first. Um, so customer experience nowadays, what is it? Well, it's the full end-to-end -end experience. So uh, w with Amazon, for example, it's the moment that somebody first hears about Amazon from a friend, which I don't think that really happens anymore. We all know who Amazon is, uh, to the moment that somebody gets a package in their door and opens it. And that's interesting because a lot of companies now, they're looking to Amazon as being kind of the be all and end all in customer experience. But the Amazon model, there's nothing actually that special about it. Um, it's not, so we hear a lot of talk these days about disruptive innovation and lots of different kind of disruptive models. The Amazon model isn't actually that disruptive, but what they do very well is that they've got low prices, they've got a really large selection. So if you think of the average bookstore has about 100,000 titles or whatever. Amazon has millions of titles, and Amazon makes 34 or 40% of its revenue from titles that aren't stocked in your average bookstore. So they're very much making money from the long tail, and it's very convenient. You can order off Amazon now and have your product delivered by tomorrow. If you're in major cities like London or New York, you can order something now and have whatever it is you've ordered delivered to you within the hour. So that's a very, very compelling thing. Um, so they have made customer experience a competitive advantage. Um, McKinsey, the management consulting company, they have developed this model, this kind of updated model to the marketing funnel that we discussed that they call the consumer decision journey. Um, and it's quite a mature way of looking at the, the consumer decision making process. And they've actually updated that th this month. And we can see here, so if it's a product that we don't know, something needs to drive our consideration. And once we consider a product, then we start to evaluate the product and its substitutes, and then we might buy it. And here's the thing, if we can focus on the experience and get that really, really right, then actually we can create a loyal customer or a brand advocate, and we can keep them in a loop then so that they don't go back to the consideration and evaluation stage anymore. They've had such a good experience with our business that they stay customers because why is that important and why was I saying the marketing funnel might be a bit outdated? Because it was very much focused on driving intention to purchase. Whereas actually, if we can acquire customers and keep those customers, that's also really good because the number one thing that influences me buying something, and I would argue most consumers buying something, is that we've bought it before. We know what we're going to get, we know it works and so on. So there are a lot of um, very interesting companies that are scaling quite well that focus on customer experience. One of those companies is Airbnb. Um, and one of their founders, actually he was reading a book about Walt Disney and uh, he saw that the, the length that Walt Disney went through to, to get his movies made and so on. Um, so this guy in Airbnb said, well what I want to do is I want to track um, 
I want to create storyboards of all of our customers, their, their journey. So that's people who book accommodation, but also accommodation providers. And he called this project Snow White. And what's interesting is, and I don't think we can actually see it in this slide at the bottom here, um, the bottom left, his thing is, we're not just selling rooms, we're selling experiences, we're selling trips. Um, and that's really important because in the Airbnb business culture, everything that they do is focused on customer experience. So I noticed, I took a look at yesterday or last week, and I looked at their open roles, and you can see here, they've got all these jobs in Dublin for customer experience specialists. They're not asking for call center agents or anything like that, they're saying, customer experience specialists, and everything about their culture is about being customer focused. And as uh, the students in the room will know, you'll have probably heard that quote from Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and, but it's not just something that they talk about, it's something that they actually do and they live in terms of their values. So, and they deliver it offline as well. So even though uh, there was a lady from Accenture earlier on, she was talking about, um, Airbnb being this uh, accommodation provider but not actually owning any rooms. But they do get involved in the offline side of stuff as well. So on the right here we have this example of uh, a lady who had booked accommodation but she needed a stroller. And she mentioned this on Twitter. And Airbnb saw this and they said, okay, we, we want to make this person's experience a positive one. So they actually sent a stroller to the accommodation provider. And that might sound like that's a strange thing to do, but what they've done is um, they've created a very positive experience for the person booking the accommodation, which is going to drive their kind of advocacy. Um, and also they've created a positive experience for the accommodation provider as well, because they now have a stroller that they can make available to other families in the future. So it's a good business decision. It's not just being nice. We can't talk about customer experience without mentioning Uber. Um, has a lot of fans and has a lot of critics. Uh, but in terms of, let's, let's talk about the customer experience and how it works as opposed to what we may think of, of the business. So if we think of our traditional taxi experience, okay, and this, is, this taxi experience goes back to uh, the 17th or the, the 18th century in London, uh, where we might hail a taxi on the side of, of the road, or we might call into the cab office uh, to book a taxi, or dial a cab, but they might say, well actually, we won't have a cab to you for another half an hour, because we only have th three cabs on the road, and they're all busy at the moment. So we have to wait, um, and then we need to tell them where to pick us up. So where I live in uh, the inner city in Dublin, it's a really tricky place for people to find. It's always brutal for taxis or getting takeaways delivered. Um, so we need to give our driver landmarks and help them find where we are. Um, and then we're required to pay in cash at the end of a ride. That's fine, okay, no big deal. But we've no visibility in terms of what that is going to cost us before we take that journey, unless we've taken a similar journey before. Um, and we've no way of giving feedback. And if we don't get the taxi plate number, if we happen to leave our wallet or something in the car or leave a bag behind, that's it, it's probably gone. Um, Whereas with Uber, we have this really nice, seamless experience. We have the app on our phone, and we can book a taxi in one click. Um, and we can see the electronic status of our car location and the estimated time of arrival, so that's quite attractive. But not only that, we can see a picture of our driver, and we can see ratings of our driver. So if we don't like those ratings, we can say, actually, I'm going to cancel this booking. I want to get another driver. Um, but that's no good for Uber. So Uber obviously wants to make sure uh, that it has good drivers. Um, GPS-based pickups, so we don't need to worry about giving the local landmarks saying, yeah, there's a spa around the corner, stop there or turn right and so on. They know where we are. And we're charged via credit card at the end of our journey through our app. So we don't need to worry about rooting through our, our change in our pockets or giving the driver our money to pay for the ride and wait for them being really slow to give you a change because uh, they're waiting for a tip and all that sort of stuff. And we don't even need to talk to the driver if we don't want to. And we can rate the driver at the end of the journey. Um, and they can also rate you. So it's a very, very nice customer experience. So even though Uber doesn't own any of these cabs, um, that doesn't necessarily matter to us as consumers. 
we are evaluating Uber on the customer experience. Um, I saw on Friday, um, so uh, Ryanair, I know Ryanair has come up a couple of times today. Uh, Michael O'Leary, apparently his value or his, the, the shares that he owns in Ryanair, which I think is worth over a billion euro, uh, they've gone up by 500 million euro uh, recently. Um, which is quite interesting. So Ryanair has done quite well over the last year or two. And it's because actually it has started to focus on customer experience. So while in the past they used to call customers stupid if they didn't print their boarding pass, uh, they used to, well, sorry, not Ryanair, uh, Michael O'Leary has called environmentalists lying wankers after the government wanted to introduce uh, levies, um, uh, taxes. So now they have this campaign it's not even a campaign, actually. They've gone beyond the campaign-based approach called always getting better. Um, so what they, they, they're, some of the things that they're doing is they now do the assigned seats. So there, is, there isn't this sort of priority boarding stuff where everybody pays extra to get on the plane early so they can pick their seats. Now they just assign seats. It's nice and simple. Women don't need to stuff their handbag into their hand luggage because they can only bring on one piece of hand luggage, they can now bring their handbag or men can bring on their laptop bag and so on. Um, and they've really focused on improved customer service. I was telling Dara earlier on that I remember getting a Ryanair flight once to a wedding in Barcelona and we were down in the depths of Dublin Airport Terminal 1 where Ryanair flies from and uh, the intercom or the, the, the PA system obviously wasn't working and the stewardess actually called out to people, she said, get you our passports ready. Uh, so they've really changed. They're focusing on a kind of much more of a pleasant experience. And they've actually, they are now onto their second website in the space of a year. And what's really interesting about this is, um, and I know the Sarah Lingus are doing this as well. It's only, it's only in the last few weeks that Ryanair actually has a mobile optimized website. Up until recently, they didn't have that, even though uh, their website was the only place where we could actually book a Ryanair flight. Um, and another interesting thing that they've only just done recently is you can now create an account on Ryanair so they'll remember who you are the next time you go to the Ryanair site. So it's creating a much nicer personalized experience. So once you put in your passport details this time to fly, they will remember those details the next time. Um, and I can only assume that Ryanair will kind of build on top of that to create extra um, ancillary things around that. Um, and this has kind of resulted in the last year or so, their passenger loads have been at about kind of a steady 90%. Um, and their share price has actually doubled uh, since January 2014, uh, which is like for an airline, airline kind of shares generally tend to stay uh, fairly even, and Ryanair's were at about three euro or something like that for years, and now they're up to about 14 euro. Um, another really good example of a company that does a really good job of customer experience is uh, the UK retailer, John Lewis, and you're probably familiar with their ads that they uh, release at Christmas time. Um, but about five years ago, they really started focusing on what they call omni-channel customer experience. Now, if we think of the word omni, it comes from, from that word, I think it's uh, Greek, omniscient. Um, so what they're trying to do is personalize their customers' experiences, whatever channel they choose to engage with John Lewis. So if it's in store, if it's over the phone, if it's through their app, or if it's on their website, it will always be personalized. So for example, if you're on the John Lewis website and you want to ring the store to find out if they have the product that you're looking for, or certain sizes and so on, the number that you see on the John Lewis site, if you call that number, the person that answers the phone to you, they know what you're looking at. So it's not a, it's not a separate experience. They know actually you've just spent some time clicking around um, handbags or whatever it happens to be. So we know how to help you. So the, what they're trying to do, particularly on phone, is replicate the in-store experience on the phone. And they will try and solve a person's problem while they're on the phone. So if, if that's getting them to buy something or helping them make their decision, they do that on the phone and they do that equally well online. So much so um, that 28% of their sales 
are now online, which is phenomenal. Because like John Lewis is, will be kind of, be like Arnott's or kind of maybe somewhere between Arnott's and Brown Thomas. Uh, so it sells some kind of expensive items. It's not all cheap stuff. So that's quite a nice, that's a nice figure for their sales online. And that's growing at about 20% a year. Um, but other companies that are focusing on personalization, they also report um, generally at about a 20% uplift in sales. So I, I spoke to uh, one of the major travel companies last week and I presented this stat and they said, you know what, that's exactly the number um, that we have as well. So this is kind of a large travel agent. And once they started trying to personalize experiences, they saw this uplift in sales. So it really does drive the bottom line. And in terms of thinking of the bottom line, okay, well, let, let's, let's drill down on these things. Okay, higher engagement and conversion rates, that's fine. Better brand perception and loyalty, fine. And then, but back to that thing, renewal, um, cross-sell and upsell. So it comes back to that thing, once we've acquired a customer, we give them a positive experience and then they'll keep coming back to us. They're in that, uh, that loyalty loop. Um, so back to our consumer decision journeys, they look more like a spider web than a funnel. Uh, it's really, really difficult for marketers to track. So much so that only about 17% of marketers that we've surveyed claim that they are fully capable of understanding consumer journeys. So while we may talk about this sort of omni-channel customer experience and personalization and so on, it is really difficult to do that. And even uh, for companies like Aerolingus and Ryanair, while they're starting to personalize their experience through the web and through the app and so on, once somebody gets on the plane, the stewards and stewardesses still don't actually know who that person is. But if we, if we really want to think about that single customer view, um, then our stewards and stewardesses should actually know, well, actually, that's Sean Donnelly sitting in seat 16A, and he really hates peanuts, so we need to keep him away from him, or whatever. Um, and only 8% of marketers say that they have a single platform that manages uh, their data. So data is obviously a huge thing, and Accenture were talking about that earlier on. And we think that the reason why such a small number of marketers or companies say that they have a single platform is probably because of legacy systems. And we're kind of at this, um, uh, this sort of uh, juncture where who makes the decisions to buy these marketing technology platforms? Is it the chief technology officer or is it the marketing director? Or we see these kind of new roles starting to surface such as the chief digital officer and so on. Um, so that might be one of the reasons, it could just be a political reason. Um, so whether we see that as an opportunity or a threat, that's up to, to ourselves. But here's the thing. Um, According to research by a guy at Yale University, the average lifespan of a company these days is only about 18 years. So that actually means that in about 10 years, 40% uh, of the companies on the S&P 500, uh, we, we won't even know who they are. So if we think back to our examples of Airbnb and Uber, we didn't know who they were three or four years ago. Uh, Facebook, uh, we, we talked about Facebook earlier on and Pinterest and Instagram and all these kind of companies. We didn't know who they were 10 years ago. And we, we saw Kean showed a slide earlier on uh, for MySpace and Bebo. They've come and gone and they've had huge valuations in between and now they're just distant memories. So uh, what's the key to competitive advantage? Well, we need to find a way to joining up our data and systems because only by doing that will we be able to deliver consistent experiences um, that are synced and responsive to devices and channels, and most importantly, individuals, so that we can make them personalized, uh, proactive, and contextual. If I can leave you with one final note, if we're talking about customer experience, it's that whatever role we have within an organization nowadays, we're all marketers. Um, and if we consider a quote by Peter Drucker, he said, because the purpose of business is to create a customer, the business enterprise has two and only two functions, innovation, so product innovation, and marketing. Everything else is just costs. Marketing is the distinguishing 
uh, unique function of a business. So we're very much, we're all marketers now. And I think if we think of those companies like Airbnb that are uh, hiring customer experience specialists, those guys, they very much understand how important they are to the business. So they understand their internal value proposition. And even retail stores who need to train up their staff on kind of in-house digital products and so on, those sales staff and stores now, they need to understand their internal value proposition in terms of what can they deliver to the bottom line of the business because they're marketers, we're all marketers. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, what do you think is the number one thing that anybody in the audience can do to either get a job in social media or to prove their worth in their ideas and their excellence in this area? Um, okay, that, that's a really good question. I think, um, so obviously there are the functional and mechanical skills in terms of using different platforms. But actually there's also, what's really important these days is the ability to think strategically and have empathy uh, with customers. So we really need to, if we want to have that single customer view, it's not just about technology and getting all these kind of very sexy kit and so on. We need to think about the end customer and understand what do they need, what problem do they need to be solved, and how can we position ourselves to do that. Um, and as an individual, if I was applying for a job somewhere, I think it would very much, I would be uh, focusing my story around being able to understand customers um, and think strategically. Again, as I say, tools come and go, mechanics change. Um, so another thing actually would be demonstrating that we can learn and that we can take responsibility for our own learning to stay on top of trends and skills. Great. Sean, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Could I invite our panel speakers to the stage, please?